Hello, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those of you in, in China and good morning for the attendees in, in Europe. My name is Javier Baut and I'm the Business Development Advisor at the EU SME Center. Welcome to the EU SME Center webinar series. First of all, I would like to apologize for the delay. We have some uh, technical uh, problems. So with no further ado, I will uh, start uh, with the webinar. Uh, first, uh, as you might know, there is a console in the right in the right top part of the, the of your screen uh, we will encourage you to do uh, answer any questions during the, the webinar we will try to answer those at the end in the Q&A session so a little bit about the EU SME Center we are a project uh, fully founded by the European Union our main purpose is we try to help the companies to get ready uh, for China so we provide a series of services like uh, information and advice. We, we have a strong uh, knowledge center. You can download our publications from our website. You will need to register, but it's a free, uh, free membership and it's very, very straightforward. It takes less than five minutes. We also will ask your, your inquiries and we, are, we have a, all the knowledge in our center is divided in four, four departments, business development, legal, standards and conformities, human resources and, and training. We do also have some other support uh, services like hot desking. If you come to China, you can stay at our offices for uh, less than two weeks and you can use our physical location, have meetings here and get uh, access to our knowledge. We try to organize also matchmaking and networking events to help you understand the market and the opportunities here. Today's uh, webinar is about uh, Shanghai. We have two, two uh, very good speakers. One is from the EEN uh, Shanghai, and another one is uh, uh, from the P PWC, also with a lot of expertise. Uh, now you can see some of the, the key figures of the, of the cities we are, we are talking during this uh, webinar series. We already did a talk about Tianjin, Changsha, and today's Shanghai. And you can see, well, like the, the per capita is one of the highest. And you can see also the population is the highest in this in this series. Uh, as you could see also in this the following slide, the GDP growth year by year is not so impressive. You you will see that it's even the lowest for the for the cities we are comparing. But this is because uh, Shanghai is already really developed. So definitely, uh, as you might might be aware, Shanghai is is, is one of the, the the ideal destination for foreign companies. You can see a lot of foreigners living and working in Shanghai and it's really a very developed city. So um, I will let the, the speakers now do the, their presentations. Uh, first it will be Mr. Huilin Zhao and uh, he's a president of the Technology Transfer Department and Information Department at Shanghai Technology Transfer and Exchange and he has been in STTE since 2003 spent uh, also eight years in Shanghai Science and Technology Investment, Deputy Manager of the Investment Division, uh, which uh, give him a very solid solid experience uh, in management and investment. He also holds a master's degree in Computer and Information Science from a uh, Zhao Tong University, one of the top universities in China. So I would like to uh, give him the microphone and he can start with his presentation. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. Zhao, and please uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Javier. It's a pleasure to join this seminar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zhao Huiling. Uh, Javier, can you do me a favor? Next week, please. Sure. Before joining the great framework of EN, STDE has devoted itself to technology transfer and the innovation service for almost two years. Uh, STDE was awarded Shanghai United International Technology Transfer Center by Ministry of Science and Technology of China. STDE service is, is directed to SME, which is focused in the demand for innovation and through uh, the chip network. Next slide, please. Our core service include five parts. They are information consultation service, R&D services, and in-depth value added services such as the study, etc. 
and value assessment analysis and international knowledge transfer services. Next slide, please. The e and East China Consortium was established two years ago. The e and East China framework has covered Shanghai and Jiangsu provinces, and the framework is focused in the NC Delta area. With this NC Delta area, its population is about 159 million. With total output of GDP is about one sixth of whole China. We have three partners in these areas two from Shanghai area and the other one is from Jiangsu provinces. Next slide, please. Javier, can you turn to the next slide? To uh, to keep up with your presentation, but unfortunately there is a delay in the in the internet, so the the change of the slide is it's very slow. But Please go ahead, like yeah. later by later, the audience will be seeing your, your presentation. Okay. Uh, NCTE is the last one joined EN in China, but we try to fit in the EN frame and facilitate the service of PA within the shortest time. During the last two years, we carry out a series of activities in the EEN framework and promote China-EU SME cooperation with these activities. In these slides, you will see totally 15 activities, but we have more activities more than these. Uh, actually, you will see a couple of them are from uh, uh, we have uh, activities with uh, North American partners, one with ASEAN counterpart. But most activities in this list, we have uh, partnership with uh, EU countries. Here are the two examples. Last year, in May, we have a China-EU Technology Transfer Conference. We invited excellent EN colleagues from Netherlands, Denmark, UK, and Poland to discuss with peers from China. The conference theme is open innovation and cooperative innovation. During this conference, we discussed the differences between China and EU's innovation service system and methods. The awareness of these differences will inspire us for future cooperation. And now the second slide, no, the previous one. Thank you, Javier. The second example is very plastic EN activities or a brokerage average. We were used to use the name matchmaking event. Javier, the previous one. Last year, in November, the biggest comprehensive international industry fair of Shanghai, we have an EN matchmaking event. Our partner from EN Denmark and EN UK. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Jao. We're trying to put the slides that you're talking about, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not possible for us. I'm, I'm very sorry for that, yes, and sorry yes. to the Just, audience. Yes, yes, yes. I know. Just previous one. Mm. Uh, focusing on clean energy and life science, we arrange face-to-face -face discuss discussion, and the, now the picture is about EU company project presentation and negotiation between China and EU companies. Our staffs have done detailed records of negotiation and 
carry on following up tracking, tracking feedback and services. Currently, we have some projects in collaborative negotiation phases. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to talk about individual services from ENEC. In terms of individual services, we uh, divide it by two of them. First, identify different demands from clients and partners. We focusing on different area of industry. Also, uh, to know what kind of mode for cooperation. In terms of individual services, we just uh, provide a ten kind of services like due diligence, policy consultation, IP issues, etc. etc. Okay, next slide please. Based on these activities, we have reached many uh, agreements. We have made uh, quite a few last year, which is outstanding in the whole China area. Later, I will show you two partnership agreement cases. Next slide, please. Okay, this case is between the partner in Austria and partner in Shanghai. The Austrian company approaching the CATT in Linz, Austria. They would like Linz people to help them to develop their market in Shanghai. And then we know this from BBS system EN network. So we finalize have them to reach the agreement within four months. But the other cases are not too simplicated. The next cases, it took us about three years to reach the agreement. From the beginning, it's just a licensing agreement between UK and the Shanghai company. And later on, they were further demand for further cooperation with capital increase and also something like traditional due diligence services from both sides. So we help them and in the middle of last year they reached a new agreement with a substantially uh, solid equity investment from Shanghai to uh, London. So that's all of my introduction. In case of a question Please contact the following people, Cathy Zheng. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zhao. I'm sorry for the technical uh, problems we have experienced. And, and thank you very much for your interest in the uh, presentation and getting uh, more information and giving more information to the European uh, SMEs about the E and Shanghai. And I hope there is more projects coming on this, this year. So uh, next. Uh, presentation will be uh, about the Shanghai pilot, pilot free trade zone. Uh, we think this uh, Shanghai is already a city that is very well known for the European companies. So we wanted to focus on these new developments and what is new in the, in the city. And for that, we have uh, with us uh, Miss Anthea Wong. She joined Pride Waterhouse Coopers in 1993. So she she leads a national team that specializes in providing. Uh, regulatory, uh, advisory, and implementation services ranging from market entry solutions, PRC structure setup, cash representation strategies to restructuring solutions such as equity transfer, M&A, liquidation, ACT. She's familiar with China foreign investment environment and regulatory framework, and she had a hands-on experience assisting clients, especially those from the retail and consumer sector to structure their operations in, in China and penetrate uh, the market. So as you can see, uh, Anthea is uh, really, really experienced in this topic and, and she has done a lot of presentations uh, about the Shanghai Pillow Free Day Zone. So with that, she will start the presentation. Thank you, Javier. So um, 
Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you today this, this hot topic, Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone. What are the breakthroughs? Um, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone was approved by the State Council of China on 22nd of August 2013 and formally launched on 29th September 2013. The formation of the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone was driven by the central government as a top-down project. It is meant to be a pilot testing ground for China's further market developments, for China's um, further market openings and reforms. The emphasis is on innovation of reforms rather than provision of tax incentives to attract investment. If successful, the same model will be replicated and promoted in other parts of China over time. Now, uh, my agenda today, you know, I give you some overview you know, about the child, um, of the um, Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone. Okay, so, um, okay, so here comes the, the overview. I mean, yeah. Uh, the Pilot Free Trade Zone is located in Pudong of Shanghai. It is built on the existing basis of the original Shanghai Comprehensive Free Trade Zone, which comprises four areas with a total area of 28.78 square kilometers. These four areas are Waigao Chao Bonded Logistics Park, which was formed in 2004 with a focus on logistics operations, and then Waigao Chao Free Trade Zone, which is actually the first and widely re recognized as the most established bonded zone in China, which was set up back in 1990. It forms the core of the new pilot free trade zone. And then we've, um, we have the Pudong Airport Free Trade Zone, which was formed in 2010, providing bonded facilities for air freight. And then finally, we've got um, Yangshan Port Free Trade Zone as part of the, um, the pilot free trade zone. It is located in the deep water port of Yangshan Port. It is relatively further off from the rest of the pilot free trade zone areas. And part of it is actually in an island in the jurisdiction of Zhejiang province. Its main focus is international shipping, and it also facilitates bonded futures delivery. Unlike other special zones, such as um, Qianhai, Hengqin in the south, which are relatively newly developed areas, these existing four areas in Shanghai, they are all very well developed and they should offer a more solid foundation and infrastructure for the launch of the first pilot free trade zone in China. On this slide, um, we have the timeline of the regulatory development of the Shanghai pilot free trade zone. Before the official launch, we've got the overall plan for the development already announced by the State Council in July 2013. And at the end of August, 2013, the pilot free trade zone was authorized to suspend some of the administrative approval items, thereby making approvals easier and more simplified. From the official launch uh, in late September last year up till now, most of the implementation regulations, including the liberalization measures on financial policies, RMB policies, cross-border foreign exchange administrative policies, were already issued. Despite some delay in the issuance of these measures, the regulatory, the regulatory process over the past six months is still relatively fast. It is a very positive sign that the government is really pushing the momentum of reforms ahead. Let's take a look at the big picture behind the reform policies. As mentioned earlier, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone is a top-down project driven by the top government authorities with the objective to, first of all, keep China competitive as a destination for foreign investment. As we all know, China is no longer the global factory of the world. And to remain competitive, the focus of the pilot free trade zone is more on relaxation of service sectors coupled with facilitation measures in financial aspects, currency aspects, and improvement of government efficiency, etc. And second, explore innovative measures to further transform the investment environment and make it more market-driven or market-oriented. 
and third objective to enhance the internationalization of RMB, that is a Chinese currency, in order to help China better withstand currency risk and keep up with the pace of China's economic growth and development. And the final objective, uh, of course the launch of um, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone uh, really marks the beginning of more liberalization and reforms. The top leaders actually said that the target is to replicate the reforms to other parts of China in two to three years time. So I'll show you some policy highlights. Um, these include relaxation of financial sector and forex control, further opening up of inbound investment. For example, you know, U European companies investing in China uh, would be under this category. And, and then um, optimized customs and trade supervision, and simplified investment administration, and finally, increase in you know, certain incentives. But I cannot stress more that this is really not the focus. I will walk you through more details in the following slides to come. I believe that you will be interested to know how many companies have been set up and what types of companies are they since the launch of the pilot free trade zone. In fact, before the official launch of the pilot free trade zone, on the original platform of the four special areas which I introduced to you earlier, a total of about 13,000 entities had already been established. Over 60% of them are foreign invested entities. And from October 2013, that is the launch of the pilot free trade zone, up to mid-February this year, 21 foreign and, in, and domestic banks were established and more than 6,000 new entities were formed. 7,000 applications for company formation were under process. As you can see from the, um, from the first pie chart, most of these companies are trading companies or you know, trading and service companies. The growth rate of new entities in the past six months is really huge. But over 90% of these entities are local domestic Chinese companies. It seems that most foreign investors are taking a wait and see attitude and are still studying the advantages of the pilot free trade zone. We believe that with almost all the new implementation regulations already issued by the end of March this year, the number of FIEs or foreign investor enterprises in the zone should increase. So let's now take a more in-depth look at the key features or key policies of the pilot free trade zone. The adoption of the negative list for the purpose of encouraging foreign investment and simplifying approval procedures is a key and important feature pioneered by the pilot free trade zone. The traditional foreign investment catalog, which classified foreign investments into encouraged, restricted and prohibited categories, of course those not included are permitted, is no longer applicable in the pilot free trade zone. Currently, the negative list is still fairly long, covering 18 broad industry types involving down to over 1,000 smaller categories of business. But the negative list will be revised and hopefully shortened on an annual basis. Those industries or sectors not appearing on the negative list can enjoy more simplified establishment procedures. They can enjoy what we call the national treatment by simply applying for registration and obtaining the business license without having to go through approval process. I'd like to mention that the pilot free trade zone has also spearheaded these practices. There are no longer any requirements on minimum register capital, no requirement on time limit for capital injection, and no requirement for capital verification. The in investor can actually make their own decisions based on business needs and specify these in their articles of association. The concept of total investment is also not a must. 
Further, annual inspection has been replaced by a simplified annual filing. Of course, all these are now being gradually rolled out all over China with implementation of the new company law effective from the 1st of March this year. The further opening up of service sectors is obviously important. These sectors cover financial services, shipping, various modern services such as advertising, travel agencies, insurance, professional services such as legal service, social services such as investment in hospitals, and cultural services, etc. The relaxation comes in three forms, mainly relaxation in shareholding limit held by foreign investors, relaxation in entry requirements, and relaxation you know, in business scopes. The approval time for setting up a foreign investment entity in the pilot free trade zone is now about 10 working days. Or I should, you know, I, I should have put it in the right way. It's not really the approval time, but the establishment time. Because if your company does not appear on the negative list, you don't really have to apply for approval. You simply go for registration. It's also important to mention that the approval time or the registration time for outbound investments, meaning local Chinese entities investing outside, investing abroad, has also been substantially reduced to 10 working days as compared to several months outside the zone. This may encourage more domestic Chinese companies to use the pilot free trade zone as a platform for making outbound investments. The local approval authority of the pilot free trade zone is currently allowed to process outbound investment application of projects under US dollars 300 million. It's expected that this threshold may be raised to US dollars 1 billion in the very near future. And as a matter of fact, the first outbound deal in the pilot free trade zone was already completed in March this year. So that company, you know, um, we know that it has taken less than 10 days you know, to get everything done, you know, from registration down to remitting the money out, out of China. So that's really quick. So in anticipation of the financial reform and coupled with more relaxed setup policies, foreign banks are amongst the first batch of investors to, in, to establish in the pilot free trade zone. And amongst all the new policies, financial reform is the most eye-catching because it brings about significant breakthroughs. The implementation regulations in this aspect were one by one issued by the People's Bank of China, PBOC, and the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, or SAFE, since the end of February this year. They cover you know, several very important areas, including, first of all, liberalization of interest rates, that is to reduce government interference and gradually let market forces determine interest rates. Second, encouraging more, cro more cross-border use of RMB. And third, greater relaxation regarding capital account items. Of course, in this respect, risk management is always a key consideration of the Chinese government. And finally, simplification in various foreign exchange administrative policies, uh, for example, replacing the approval requirements, record filing, simpler process for outbound lending, and so on and so forth. I'd like to provide here some updates on the latest regulations governing the use of RMB and foreign exchange administration. Regarding RMB, Outbound RMB borrow, outbound by RMB lending is now allowed, meaning that a company registered in the free trade zone can, can lend RMB to its related parties outside China. And the quota can either be, can either be one time of the paid in capital or the difference between the total investment and registered capital. Of course, for those already established in, in the zone because uh, they still ha have the total investment concept. And also cross-border RMB cash pooling is now possible. An enterprise regis registered in the pilot free trade zone 
can be used to perform centralized cash management and treasury functions for the group. Now on the forex side, enterprises registered in the zone can choose to convert the entire amount of forex or forex capital into RMB, thereby hedging exchange risks. That said, the use of registered capital should still be subject to the same authenticity checks. And enterprises registered in the zone can enjoy a greater quota of outbound lending, lending at 50% of the company's owner's equity versus 30% outside the zone. And qualified enterprises can also set up a forex cash pooling account and centralized cash management for member companies in China. And um, within an approved limit, the money in the cash pool can be freely transferred between the zone and overseas. All in all, these measures are aimed to bring China's practices closer to international practices and create greater facilitation to investments and trade. And they should be relevant to all industry sectors. So you may ask, how can I benefit from the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone? So what, what will be the relevance to me? Now, um, trading is actually a, a basic feature of the pilot free trade zone. And what is special is that the boundary between the pilot free trade zone and overseas is liberalized, meaning that there's, re there's free movement of goods between the zone and overseas. So, and as such, the customs and CIQ, commodity inspection and quarantine procedures, have been further simplified for shipments from overseas or from shipments between China and overseas. Besides, customs classification for bonded goods have been made easier and more efficient. And all these are supported by corresponding electronic platform developed by the government and also a reduction of authorities which the companies have to deal with. Sorry, I, I noticed that there's a time lag between the slides, but I'll go on you know, speaking. And the beneficiaries would include logistics hubs, regional distribution centers, trading companies, bonded manufacturers, commodities traders, etc. And with the new pilot free trade zone policies, you may explore setting up a pilot free trade zone company to perform these functions such as internal service center and to make use of the you know, relaxation in cross-border and you know, treasury management functions. So as such you may make cross-border cash pooling arrangement and enhance you know, better use of regional uh, treasury center you know, which has been made possible in the pilot free trade zone. And as regional headquarters there may be added advantages as well or added incentives. And um, as I mentioned earlier, a free trade zone company can also be used as an investment platform, both maybe for um, inbound and outbound investments, but it seems that for, it's more relevant for outbound investments, that's for local Chinese, local Chinese entities. And then um, those who operate um, 3PL third-party logistic services, bonded warehousing services, regional distribution centers, so they, they may also find the free trade zone policies helpful because of the simplified customs policies. And certain and different trading and service companies, they may also benefit in different ways. For trading companies, they may enjoy reduced time with respect to customs clearance and you know, associated with that will be lower processing costs in terms of time and money. And for manufacturing company, they will find it less of a hassle you know, to deal with the customs handbook because of the you know, improved and simplified ERP system to report to the customs authorities. And finally, for various service sectors, so um, you, I would really encourage you to explore, you know, whether for your sector or sectors, 
there are opportunities offered by the bonded free trade zone. For example, shipping, media, and games. These are these may not, you know, be as open elsewhere as the pilot free trade zone. As I have repeatedly mentioned, there is basically no general preferential tax policy in the pilot free trade zone. However, certain industry-specific tax incentives are still available. For example, VAT refund on financial leasing, duty exemption on production equipment, and other financial incent incentives may also be available by industry, but subject to individual approval processes. The emphasis of the government is that incentives could be granted provided that there is no base erosion or profit shifting. But, and of course, you know, these should be granted according to international practice. So now let's take a look at the challenges of operating in the free trade zone and what you should expect next. While many companies are gauging the development of the pilot free trade zone, exploring opportunities and considering whether they should set up an entity there, please note that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So how will the free trade zone be relevant to you? So does it allow you to engage in an industry which is restricted or prohibited elsewhere? So let me give you an example. For example, the production and sales of computer games, it has been long prohibited in China, but was newly open to foreign investors just in the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone. Or will it be worthwhile to set up an entity for cash pooling purposes? And how does this Free Trade Zone entity fit in your group structure, long-term strategy, and its tax implications and feasibility to apply for special incentives should all be carefully considered. As we know that the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone is a testing model to be replicated and promoted. So you may, you may ask, I don't have anything in Shanghai, so shall we wait for another Pilot Free Trade Zone? in other parts of China before making a move? The answer is yes and no, depending on factors such as market needs, competitive landscape, your internal business plans, and external service infrastructure, etc. So these may all determine the urgency of your need to set up in the pilot free trade zone. As far as we know, a number of other locations have already applied to the central government to set up pilot free trade zones. For example, Tianjin Binhai area, so that is along the coast in, um, Tian, in Tianjin. And the other special zones in southern China, Shenzhen Qianhai, Guangzhou Nansha, and Zhuhai Hengqin, are all contemplated to jointly form a southern China pilot free trade zone. There are some other locations um, which I have not put on this slide. They include uh, Shandong, Chongqing, Xiamen, etc. They have all been reportedly you know, be very interested in forming pilot free trade zones to improve competitiveness. So the takeaway for my presentation today, Shanghai pilot free trade zone can be relevant to you whether you are a newcomer or have already had significant presence in China. If you are a newcomer, then you may go through the negative list and see if your, your sector or your industry can simply be registered in the zone so, so that you can enjoy you know, the faster setup procedure and simplified registration processes. And if you've already got significant presence in China, then maybe the pilot free trade zone will be interesting to you in the area of catch pooling, because by having a, a platform or an entity there, that company can help you do catch pooling, both in RMB and, and foreign currency, but of course in, you know, 
in different accounts to be managed with the bank. And second, the impact of the pilot free trade zone is broad and also largely industry specific. You have to have tailor-made strategy for, for your own business. And of course, you should map your strategy with thorough review and planning. You may also want to actively engage in dialogues with the responsible authorities to increase clarity and reduce uncertainties. And based on our experience, we do realize that there are certain practices uh, which you can only you know, have more certainty after talking to people because they cannot be you know, really uh, written, written down in the, you know, in, in the regulations in black and white. And finally, Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone is a precedent for other areas. It may be launched in other cities in the near future. It is a signal of further financial reforms and broader opening of investment and trade in China. So with this, um, so here concludes my presentation. So if you have any questions, you are very welcome to, to ask. I'll be very happy to address your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anthea. That was an excellent presentation. And we do already have uh, quite a lot of uh, questions. I, I would like actually uh, to ask you a personal question. Uh, what, how you how you will compare the pilot footage zone in Shanghai with Hong Kong? Is this something that this zone is trying to emulate Hong Kong? Is, is that's, <laughs> Do you think that the experience that the Chinese government is trying to, to do? Well, I think that's a very, um, a very, very interesting question, and often asked by um, by businesses and also in the government authorities in Hong Kong. Um, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone, the target, the target is to become a, an international trading center, international shipping center, and international financial center. So uh, immediately, uh, what you may have the reaction that so it is exactly a duplication of Hong Kong. So, um, well, but if we you know, look at the policies in greater detail, I think that you know, in order for Shanghai to, um, you know, to be another Hong Kong, it would really take time. It's going to take time. Uh, because um, now we, we still have the negative list. So to make investments in, in the free trade zone, um, it's not really like um, you, know, you go and you, you register a company. You have to, you know, um, to make sure that uh, you understand the negative list. And uh, regarding um, foreign exchange administrative measures, uh, it is true that a lot of the measures have been liberalized. So it is indeed very good news for investors, for foreign investors in China. Uh, but having said that, as compared to Hong Kong, so I think you know, Hong Kong should still have an edge, you know, um, at least you know, uh, for the time being. So I think Hong Kong really have to, you know, work really hard, you know, to keep up its uh, current advantages. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have another question. Is you mentioned that the pilot footage zone is an already developed area with quite a number of enterprises established. So I would like to ask if there is sufficient office space for a registration process. Oh, okay. So thank you for the question. So the person who asked this um, question probably. Um, knows that the, the pilot free trade zone is actually quite full. Uh, as I presented in my, in my slides, uh, there were already about 13,000 companies registered in the zone. And the main area of the zone is the Wai Gaochiao free trade zone, which is uh, just about 10, kilo, 10 square kilometers. So uh, right, um, it is really you know, running out of space. Um, so if you are looking at setting up a manufacturing of facility, so that may be a bit tough. And we know that the free trade zone authorities, they are working with um, nearby um, cities or you know, locations like in Zhejiang, Suzhou, to uh, direct these uh, manufacturing facilities to their locations. But if you are looking to invest in, um, in, the, in service sectors encouraged by the pilot free trade zone, uh, there should still be, be space. Uh, I, I need to add here that um, to set up a company in China, you will need to have a physical location. Okay, you need to have a physical location and a lease agreement. Uh, 
So um, as far as I understand, the local pilot free trade zone authorities, they do offer some very, very you know, small offices, like 10 square kilometers, for registration purposes. Okay, thank you, Antia. And now we have uh, two questions. I think they're somehow uh, related. One is like, uh, can an entity in the zone set up branches outside the, the zone? And also uh, another another attendee asked us, is, is this the, the new rules, the new re regulations of the Shanghai Free Trade Zone affect the current companies that are already established in the areas that were that were um, that were designed at the like for example a Wai Gao Chao, like a company already there, mm -hmm. like uh, do these new regulations apply to them? Oh, okay, uh, I w yes, uh, the new uh, regulations would apply to companies already established in Wai Gao Chao free trade zone. For example, um, policies around um, financial reforms, foreign exchange administrative um, simplifications, and I, I think you know, I mentioned earlier. Uh, these companies already established in the past, they, they had a registered capital and a total investment. Okay? Uh, but for new companies to be set up, um, it is not strictly required you know, to have this uh, difference between total investment and registered capital. So I think you know, um, re regarding the borrowing, the new borrowing rules, it said somewhere that um, for com so companies, they can choose. They can choose, um, you know, how they set their quota. It can either be um, the difference between the total investment and the registered capital, that is applicable to old enterprises, or to new enterprises. They can also, you know, adopt this uh, treatment, or they can opt for, you know, one time of their paid-in capital. So I hope I have answered the question. Sure. Thank you. And we have another question. It's like uh, if there is any special uh, licensing requirements uh, that have been abolished in the, in the zone. Okay. Thank you for this question. It is uh, a very, very good question. Um, I, I mentioned um, repeatedly uh, about the negative list and the fact that only registration is required if um, your sector doesn't really appear on that list. Um, but I would like to you know, emphasize that you know, a lot of the service sectors which are now being opened, they are really the special service sectors such as insurance, travel agency, and even you know, certain value-added telecommunication services, and even games. So these are all you know, um, administered by their respective special authorities in charge. Or, you know, I, I should answer that question, you know, the question in, you know, in simple terms. I would say no. So don't expect that the special licensing agree, um, requirements have all been uh, abolished. But uh, do check. Do make sure that you've checked whether your service sectors do still require any you know, special processes to be done with the authority in charge. Thank you, Anthea. And we have another question which is uh, related to also uh, licenses and, and, and requirements. And it's from a company in the, in the dairy sector. And the, the company is asking if, if that means, like with the free trade zone, that they don't need to comply with the, the requirements made by the I, AQ, SIQ, and, and, and this uh, regarding to the certificates and the, all the requirements they need to import dairy products in, into, uh, into China. Um, okay, so I think this question is actually you know, quite related to uh, the previous section about special licensing requirements. Um, well, I, you know, I haven't you know, really looked into this um, particular sector about the dairy, um, you know, dairy industry. Uh, of course, no. I think you know, we, we need to double check. But I think you know, I have ground to believe that you know, what is um, originally required relate, you know, regarding um, distribution in China with respect to you know, certification, licensing, should still be required. Because um, you know, um, the dairy um, distribution industry is, um, you know, is, is uh, one that's highly regulated. And I don't recall um, you know, re reading any new uh, relaxation in this area. 
So if I understand and see, I, it might be possible, but for, for some problems, they will be able to enter the free trade zone in Shanghai, but it will be not possible to pass to the China's mainland. So maybe to re-export it to a third country, it will be possible, but not to enter the, the China's mainland. Um, well, I think um, to... Um, there would be what it, or, or, or let me put it this way: uh, it is possible to explore how the free trade zone or the or the pilot free trade zone can be used as a platform to facilitate uh, distribution into China. For example, the bond facilities would, would still be helpful, and also with the uh, simplified and also you know more efficient customs clearance procedures. So that would also be very, you know, uh, very helpful. But just that, you know, in terms of certification, uh, I think you know, that should still be required. Um, and my suggestion is also that um, you may actually, you know, want to talk to the Free Trade Zone Administration, the local uh, authorities. Or of course, we are, we are also very help, uh, you know, happy to talk to you to see how the Free Trade Zone can really be helpful for, to you. Thank you very much. And following that, uh, your last statement, uh, we have a company asking if there is a, a, an English official website in which the, the government is uh, making updates on the new regulations and reforms by the, in the free trade zone. Okay. Uh, so this audience would like to have um, a website? A website, an official website, a link from the government where, where they can see, like if they're, if they're asking. Uh, okay, yeah, I think, you know, uh, there are certain websites of which uh, we can share, you know, after this uh, session. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So, unfortunately, we are, we are running on, out of time. So, uh, well, we would like to thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. We hope it was interesting for you. We are very sorry about the, the, the delay when we start on some technical uh, problems we have been experienced, but... Uh, there's nothing we can do, so uh, I'm sorry about that. And yet, yeah, we would like to also announce that the, this uh, Thursday we will have also a new webinar. This will be on the healthcare sector, so uh, you still have time to register and keep following us through our website. We have a new website now, so we hope you like it. And we look forward to meet you in our events. Also, we are now present at the Hangover Fair, so we have a booth, and our colleagues will be very happy to attend you. So thank you very much again and look forward to see you. Thank you, Javier. Bye-bye.